Hello, I'm Susan Green, Associate Curator of Special Collections, Archives and Research at the Philbrook Museum of Art, and welcome to Room of the Week. So today we're not really doing a room, but it's something that I've been really looking forward to, and I hope you have as well. So um, we have been exploring different spaces in Philbrook, and we explored last week our Great Hall, and we talked about being in this magnificent space. So if you were to come into Philbrook, walk through the entrance hall, through the main hallway, and go into the Great Hall, you're then greeted by these three French doors. So what happens when you go through the French doors? And let's take a look. So once you walk through those, those doors, you're out on the East Terrace. So um, this is a view uh, from this year of the East Terrace looking out to the Tempietto and then a view of the actual physical East Terrace. So once you go through the, those doors on the Great Hall, the idea is to be just awashed in nature, to have uh, see the spectacular view of the gardens, um, listen to the birds, hear the uh, sort of the breeze rustling up through the trees, feel it on your face, smell the flowers. It's all about being outside. And so this space, um, the East Terrace, and also technically what's uh, under the balcony is the loggia. So first you walk through the doors and you go to the loggia and then the East Terrace, which is has just the sky above you. So this is essentially an outdoor living space. Just like today, we build these outdoor living spaces on, on the back of our homes with barbecues and um, adjoining pools maybe. Well, the Phillipses had their outdoor living room as well, and that's the East Terrace. So let's take a, a, a couple of uh, views of these spaces. Uh, take a look. So um, on the left, I've got our historic image. On the right, an image from this year. So this is the loggia. So this is that first space as you walk out the door. Um, it is a space with this clay tile floor. You, we have this uh, succession of arches, uh, this sort of wonderful vaults and the columns. We have light fixtures that are from um, Edward Caldwell and Company in New York, just like in the rest of the house, these wonderful kind of dangling uh, lanterns. Um, but if we look at the historic image and you look at it closely, you see all of the wicker furniture. There's wicker furniture, there's tile top tables, there's um, blue and green uh, glazed jars on stands, and some of these we still have in our collection, and it absolutely is an outdoor living space. There's cushions, it's, it is a space to come and enjoy the outside, enjoy that breeze. And then if we look at a historic image of the East Terrace in the loggia, you even get a better sense of the extent, extent of this outdoor living spaces. There are multiple tables, multiple chairs, multiple chaise longs. There, it is a space for relaxing. And we know that the family really did use this space because um, a couple of the, really we only have a few images of the family uh, while they lived at Philbrook. They took lots of photographs of the rooms or had um, photographers come in and take photographs of the rooms, but we only have a few photographs of the family themselves. And they are, they're not the kind of the casual pics that we might take today. They, uh, but we have one that's pretty casual that's on the terrace. So, oh, and so this is the uh, East Terrace Terrace and probably, this is probably around 1930, 1931, and then the East Terrace today. So it the, absolutely looks nearly the same just without the furniture. But here's our kind of our, our one family photo. A photo of Wait um, on the left, Genevieve on the right, and their children, Helen, Jane, and Elliot in the middle. This photograph is taken in 1931. Um, Helen Jane's about 20. Elliot is about 13, maybe, if my math is right, in the photograph. And um, this, is, this is the place that they chose to have their photograph, their family photograph taken. The photograph of them all together um, was chosen. They chose the East Terrace. They chose to be surrounded by their gardens with the architecture just right around them. 
A couple of other photographs of the family that we have are these two, also on the East Terrace. The one on the left is from the same photo session uh, this fam of the family portrait. So this is Helen Jane and Waite, and if you look really closely, Waite has a leather leash in his hand, and there's one of their German shepherds sitting beside him. So this is a little more casual uh, picture of the family. They're, they're sitting, they're getting ready for the, the posed official portrait, but they're sitting out on the East Terrace. And then um, the photograph on the right, while Waite seems to be wearing the same pants and perhaps the same shoes, it's actually from several years later. This is from 1934. Um, and this is a photograph of Waite with his grandson, uh, Phillips Breckenridge. So his uh, beloved grandson in his lap. Um, I just love this picture. You know, you always want to squeeze the babies. He's just so cute. Um, but I love this kind of intimate moment. So this is actually one of the more casual photographs that we have of the family. And you can see that this moment when they're all together as a family, you know, Helen Jane is, is just around the corner. Um, Genevieve, the Jodin grandmother, is right there as well. It's This photograph is taken on the East Terrace. Um, so what, what is it like today? What are the details? What can we learn more about um, how this outdoor living space was put together and what the Phillips family and then the architect Edward Bueller Delp chose to include in this structure? So um, first, if you look really closely, it's it, in this image and you look under the loggia, there are a couple of bas reliefs, so sculptures that are adhered to the wall with a pretty substantial relief, so um, it sticks out a little bit from the wall. And these two panels are by an artist named Jorgen Dreyer. So let's look at them a little bit closer up, and here they are. Um, they are uh, inset, as I said, into the wall. Uh, Jorgen Dreyer was an artist, a sculptor, uh, who was from Norway and immigrated to the United States and settled in Kansas City. And he taught for a couple of years in, at what would become the Kansas City Art Institute. And according to um, some articles, the he had some issues with the trustees of the Kansas City Art Institute, which may have included the fact that when he was teaching, he included uh, had the students draw from nude models. And you can see from these reliefs that he really did understand the human body. He understand how the muscles and the bones and everything worked together. Even though these are stylized figures, you can tell he really got the human body. Uh, if you were to go up to Kansas City, you might see some of his work um, in uh, the city. The, the lions in front of um, the Kansas City uh, insurance uh, insurance company, and then the Masonic Temple. There's some sphinxes. His work is also across the city. So if uh, you, there might be some little Easter eggs finding York and Dreyer in Kansas City. But there's also a work, or what I understand may be some works by York and Dreyer also in Tulsa. So according to York and Dreyer's obituary, it listed several of his works very well-known works in Kansas City, and it listed one group of works in Tulsa. So are you ready? So this is what he also may have uh, sculpted that's in Tulsa, and that's the grotesques, or some people call them gargoyles, um, that are that uh, decorate the fill tower. So we've got this great neo-Gothic neo um, skyscraper that was built just about the same time as Philbrook by Edward Bueller Delk. And if you look above the main entrance on either side, there are two amazing grotesques, and one of them that I'm showing here, he's carrying a building very similar to the Phil Tower. So according to Jorgen Dreyer's obituary, he is the sculptor of our grotesques, and that is something that I didn't know and I was so excited to discover. But looking again at our uh, reliefs by Dreyer, the, uh, so these are two panels, multi-figured, so three figures each, two women, one man on each panel. And if we think about what they're depicting, you know, why were these subjects chosen for Philbrook? 
So on the right, we have um, two female figures with instruments and a male figure in the center who's blowing a horn. And we think about song, we think about music. Um, one of the uh, women seems to be singing, her mouth is open. On the left, we have uh, two women who, with, their, with their knees up, um, definite movement, and a man, perhaps with little fawn horns, um, holding a bunch of grapes, also with his knee up and up on the ball of his foot. So this idea of dance, of revelry, of enjoyment, they are definitely seem to be imbibing and the man seems to be referencing Bacchus maybe, so the god of wine, or Pan, so the, this uh, kind of god of uh, revelry, of throwing away your cares and, and um, just essentially partying. And so there's this, this juxtaposition of dance and enjoyment, revelry and music. And we see those two things of dance and music also in the villa. And I love that these elements are brought out on into the loggia as well. So right inside the, those three French doors, we have the organ, we have the music room, we have the dance floor. And we know um, from Genevieve Phillips, his daughter-in-law, Virginia, uh, Virginia said that Genevieve loved to dance and would dance at the drop of a hat. And we know that music, according to the family, music was really important to the family. And so this idea that music and dance is uh, all comes out into the exterior of Villa Philbrook as well with these wonderful artworks and their artworks. So that we've got um, this other art form as well, the visual art form sculpture. So let's look some more at the loggia and other kind of details that we can find. So right above both of those panels by Jorgen Dreyer are two uh, um, pieces of star, two stone carvings. Very different in format, but both right above those two panels. So the one on the left is kind of a shield shape and it says 1927. And then the one on the right is sort of a coat of arms form, a crowned coat of arms. And it has a, it's sort of divided into three with a sunrise and down at the bottom is a, a stylized W and a P. And so this is also bringing in elements that we saw in the Great Hall with this, uh, well, in Villa Philbert just in general, this nod to, um, the, to Europe, to the European past, to uh, looking at how uh, homes were decorated, villas were decorated in Italy, in France, and in England. So with the Great Hall, with our coats, our, our armor that's hanging on the, on the staircase, the kind of made up coats of arms that are included in the drapery. Here we have coats of arms and a shield that represent Philbrook that represent the family. So Philbrook was finished in 1927. The family may have actually moved in in 1928, but 1927-28, it was under construction from 26 to 27. Um, but so we have this kind of date stamp that it was finished in 1927. And then we have this um, embellished imaginary coat of arms for the Phillips family. And it's interesting at Villa Filmonte, they also have a coat of arms, but theirs is different from this one. So it's, it, they don't stick to one, they're imaginative and creative in all the things that they do. Uh, so this little, uh, I'm going to give you some Easter eggs or some kind of scavenger hunt items to find. Uh, this is a little corner. And it's a quiet little corner, but it says a lot. And there's something that I think a lot of people miss. So this is the, uh, the south edge of the loggia. And this doorway, if you were to be able to go through the doorway, this would go into the dining room. And the, the whole East Terr Terrace and Loggia is completely accessible by nearly all of the rooms that are on this east side of the building. So you could walk from the dining room into the um, Loggia and then get into the living room, or you could go around and get into the, uh, the sunroom. So everything is accessible through this exterior passageway. So this is the um, imagining the family coming out from dinner, going out maybe for an after dinner cocktail. 
Um, there's also this wonderful Griffin chair. So uh, these were part of the Phillips's property and uh, they were actually probably in the sunroom or South Terrace, but we have them here now. And they have these wonderful griffins on them with their wings extended. So look really closely at these. They are just really fantastic. Then you see a um, kind of a wrought iron uh, grill uh, protecting a window. If you look closely, it's the reverse of the uh, stained glass window by Desenso Studios, which is in the uh, basement stair. So this, the hunt, that kind of could be from the Middle Ages or it could be from the Middle Evil period or it could be contemporary for, from 1927, we're not sure. But that um, grill helps protect the stained glass window from the outside elements. And then look really closely, there is a dark box in the image just to the left of the windowsill. So that little box, when you come to Philbrook, look closely at it, it has a little push, but push button. And that push button was a buzzer. So there was a buzzer system in the house so that um, if uh, the family or guests needed something, they could push a button and it would, uh, notify staff members in the kitchen or in the staff gathering spaces that something was needed and they could come out, maybe refresh the drinks. I'm thinking some uh, gin martinis. So they could, uh, they could get, um, get assistance if they needed it. So that is our last remaining push buzzer that is extant in the house, or at least that we know about that we've identified. Okay, so if another kind of an Easter egg scavenger hunt thing are these guys. So if you step out now onto the East Terrace and you look up, you'll see that the shutters are actually pinned back by something that's decorative. So uh, forgive the middle image, it's pixelated, but I wanted to get you as, as much of a blown up image as I could of what actually that is. So the drawing on the left is just a pencil drawing. It's part of our archive. It's a drawing by Edward Bueller Delk, our architect. And you can tell he thought of every detail. So this is a shutter turnbuckle, or some people call them shutter dogs. It is a something to secure the shutters. If you look closely at the middle image, you can see that there is um, actually a, a lock. So you could, if it was um, raining or storming, you could open the window, reach out, get, um, get the shutters, pull them in, and lock them, uh, similar to what you might have in a hurricane-prone area. So you can lock the shutters, protect the window. Well, when the shutters are out, you need something to secure them to the wall so that they don't bang in the wind. So uh, creative craftspeople years and years ago developed these usually S-shaped shutter dogs. But uh, Delk didn't just stop at the typical shape. He ornamented it even further. So you can tell he has made this wonderful uh, dolphin with such personality and um, so a dolphin uh, often has the in Italian Renaissance often has this really kind of um, sometimes it looks like a lion or a puppy dog this really round face and kind of a snub nose and wonderful round eyes so that's translated onto these shutter dogs and he says, um, he even thinks about how the shutter dog should hang so where the correct point, um, uh, center point would be for the nail so that it would always, the weight, the primary weight of the shutter dog would be at the bottom and so it will hang vertically. Um, some of ours are vertical right now, some are a little askew, um, but I love this tiny detail and I don't think hardly anyone notices these wonderful little dolphins in our shutter. So look really closely for them the next time you come. Um, another little kind of Easter egg or surprise is to look for this plaque. It's on the East Terrace and I'll let you try to find it, but it's um, embedded in our architecture. And it wasn't just Waite and Genevieve Phillips who signed their names, who claimed Philbrick, put their stamp on Philbrick. Edward Bueller Delk also um, put his name on the building. And so this is his plaque. Um, it is on the East Terrace, not the front of the building, 
often you think of the front as the as the place for the public to see, the place where you might want to have a historic plaque or a plaque to really show how important something is or to claim something. But here, Edward Bueller Delk has actually put his plaque on the terrace, on the um, place closest to the garden, the place closest to nature, the place that he, I think, that he knew that the family would really use. So we have this wonderful um, historic plaque, the sort of the signature of Delk. And Delk is absolutely um, so much a part of East Terrace. And I wanted to, we have um, such fantastic architectural plans, and I wanted to show you all a, a small selection of these. The East Terrace was obviously a truly important part of the design of Villa Philbrook. It's actually the more ornate side. Um, this private side, the side that faces the garden, is so much more uh, elaborate, ornate, majestic. Um, it's, it is a space that has uh, the larger windows. It opens up. Um, and it is this, the East Terrace. Um, there are at least three or four uh, sheets of the architectural plans that just deal with the East Terrace. So I'm going to show you a few snippets from those and then look at the actual architectural elements that resulted from these plans. So the first is the garden elevation uh, plan, and you can see that Delk is really thinking about this space in these layers, of course, as an architect you would, but you have the full impact of the building down at the bottom, then you have the plan of what this interior space would be, what the loggia detailing would be, and then what an exterior space would be. The um, the the east side of the steps and the balustrade so it's this is one of my absolute favorite architectural plans because it does really show the uh, sort of the glory of the east east side of the building and i love it's called the garden elevation which is very true and through images like this, you can see this impact of the building and how it truly is integrated with the garden. And so a historic image and an image from today. Uh, and it really, that the building speaks for itself and it really has stayed pretty much the same. Our, our, um, as our Sheila Knotts, our garden, our chief horticultural, chief horticulturalist likes to say, she has this living palette. She has the architecture of the garden beds, but uh, the gardens changed so often while the Phillipses lived at Philbrook, and they have evolved since then as well. Um, so there are some details that are worked into these architectural plans, and I want to make sure that you don't miss some of these as well. Um, so we have this view, and most people who come to Philbrook are able to step out onto the East Terrace. It's one of our uh, best photo spots. But I think while they're taking a photo next to the Shell Fountain, they may not notice all of the stone, the detailing of the stonework just right um, below their waists including the, this wonderful leaf pattern, or almost like dragon scales, it could go one way, the other leaves, leaves or dragon scales, on this S-curved um, uh, portion of the balustrade, and then also this wonderful flower motif that's on this curve. It's uh, truly lovely, and it could be just plain, but this extra ornamentation gives it that little bit a uh, little bit more something else you might want most people notice but you may not have is um, another spot that Wade Phillips put his initials not just under the loggia but also on this um, pierced stonework on this railing and he put a double or he the uh, Delk requested the stonemasons to carve in this W with two P's facing either direction um, as kind of a stamp for Waite Phillips. And uh, Waite uh, was known to have put his initials on many things. If you go to the Phil Tower, there's WP on doorknobs, on the uh, doors to the elevator, um, as well as Philcade, and also at Philmont in New Mexico. 
So we've got this WP. It always changes just a little bit though, depending on the building. But here is where we have our WP. Um, something else that's part of um, the East Terrace is our, uh, this amazing fountain. So this fountain, you can see an image from 1928. This is actually from a collection of photographs from Delt, from the architect. So in 1928, he brought some photographers down and took some uh, photographs of the building, essentially for his portfolio. And this is the um, photograph he took of the fountain. The fountain doesn't have any water in it at the moment, but you can see our, the fountain today with the water sparkling. But we have these three kind of um, water sprites in between two of the bowls of the fountain. And then in the um, top section, there are two dolphins curving down with their mouths down below, and then a trident in between. And if you remember in the Great Hall, this is a similar shape to the pierced uh, plaster work of on either side of the organ. So these S-shaped dolphins um, in the plaster work, it was a vase in the, in the middle, inside, makes sense to have a vase. Here we have a trident. And the trident in this case refers to Neptune, so the god of the, of the waters, of the ocean, the sea, and it makes sense for the fountain. And then our water sprites below. So the water comes up out of the, um, the shell, the shell bowl, and then cascades down in these multiple tiers. But a lot of engineering went into this fountain. And we have that recorded in our architectural plans. So this is one of those sheets that deals with the East Terrace. And I'm gonna pull out a few specific details. So for the um, fountain, you can see how, what Delk was thinking and the instructions or the visual instructions that he gave to the stone carvers. And then also I love to see how the artisans altered or adapted those ideas, those plans for their own, um, into their own creative practice. So we have the basic format is there, the, the three bowls, the shell, and then the two uh, larger basins, or two graduated basins, and then the final pool. And we see that the um, center section still has those three, three boys. Um, they are just sort of sketches or thought or um, ideas in Delk's plans and they're fully realized in the uh, fountain itself. But then looking above, Delk had perhaps suggested a, um, a, a male face. Maybe it's Neptune, maybe it's the green man, maybe it's um, just a, a mask of some kind, but it's a face. But this same kind of shape then it morphs into these dolphins and the trident. The shape remains the same, um, sticking out kind of ears at the top, and then the hair of the man becomes the curve of the dolphin heads. And I love the way that was adapted. And so you can see here the um, front elevation, a side elevation, and I wanted to point out the uh, dragon scales or the leaf, the leaf pattern on the um, railing there on the right. And then we also have the interior work. So how it actually works, the different bowls, the pipes, how they um, join to the basement level, um, where the supply line is, where the drain line is, and what color of tile goes in the basin. All of those details are expressed in these plants. Um, also part of that larger sheet that we looked at are, is this niche. So this is on the south side of the East Terrace. And it, it, in Delk's plan, it was just an alcove. It has a masqueron, so a, a face that is like in, in a keyhole, um, keystone shape. And then he puts a, um, a, a terracotta vase or, or some sort of a pot in this space. But from the very beginning, so this photograph is uh, probably from around 1931, uh, Waite and Genevieve Phillips installed two sculptures. And here's, here are both of the sculptures. So there's a nymph with a puto or a little cupid, a little boy, and then a satyr with a puto or the cupid, the little boy. 
and they're, they flank on either side of the steps that go down from the east uh, terrace. And I, I am so intrigued by these sculptures. We don't know, we know that they're French. We know that they came from probably Paris, but I don't know who the sculptor is. And so I'm, um, that's something that I'm actively researching and trying to figure out what is the story of these? And is it the case that the Phillips family saw these in, when they were traveling to Paris? Is it the case that Percy French, their um, kind of New York consultant, found these and sent them to the Phillipses? I don't know, but I wanna find out. But right above, uh, so the mascaron, so this keystone with the shape of a face, this is something else I think a lot of people don't notice. There are four different mascarons around the exterior of Philbrick, and you have to figure out which ones they are, what the diff four different um, figures are. But this guy, he has this wonderful mustache, and he's wearing kind of a crown with grapes on it. And so this is Bacchus. So this is again the god of wine, the god of revelry, um, joy, take, putting your cares away and enjoying life. And so it connects to this revelry, the dance that we saw in the loggia, and it connects to the dance that we saw inside the house. But look closely and see if you can see the other three. They're all the way around on the exterior of the building. And um, there are a couple that are hidden on in the interior of the building, but you have to find them. And one last detail, again, to think about all of these little, all of the work and thought that goes into constructing a space. And uh, quite a bit of real estate on architectural plans is taken up by the patterning on the, um, on the floor, essentially, of the East Terrace and the Loggia. And so Delk, it, it seems so simple, but he uh, plans it out, he measures it out, he um, specifies which tile, he uh, asks for a uh, block, um, uh, a, a regular uh, square on the two um, kind of risen the areas that are up a couple of steps on either side of the east terrace and then he tilts that block into a diamond uh, across the east terrace proper um, and it gives it a little more energy and it gives it a little bit more directionality towards the garden always pointing us at the garden it's never blocking us off it's pointing us to the garden and then he specifies this herringbone pattern around these diamonds so no detail is too small whether the shutter dog or whether the pattern on the east terrace floor so the east terrace is absolutely part of our uh, lives at Philbrook it plays a starring role in our um, holiday decorations whether you look up close like on the left image or you step back away and look at the overall um, scene of the whole villa. Um, but I, we love the fact that once our, our wreaths are hung and you take look just in the right um, place that you can see a, a face on the uh, Philbrook East Terrace during the holidays. And the East Terrace has also uh, obviously been a, a gathering spot for the family and for our guests at Philbrook. It's one of our um, most beautiful spots for photographs, but it's also a wonderful spot for music. Whether it is the super cool uh, music, uh, the really groovy music of the 60s, early 70s in this photograph of the left on the left, or something really um, almost uh, really heartwarming like the Sunrise Symphony that we held last June um, with in, in amazing partnership with the Tulsa Symphony. So this was held at sunrise as the sun is coming up over the East Terrace, over the Tempietto, and these, this wonderful music that's floating up and around us as well. Um, and so the East Terrace is, of course, one of our favorite spots at Philbrook. And I am so excited that this weekend, June 6th, we are able to open to the public in our gardens and then a couple of weeks later after that we're opening uh, to the public and we ask that you reserve a spot online it will we are um, seeing how it goes taking all safety precautions 
but I can't wait to have a blanket and a book and to sit out in the gardens and to listen to the birds and just take a breath. And so I hope to see you in the gardens. I hope to see you really soon. I thank you so much and I look forward to seeing you next time.